Hello, my name is Nikhil Hupercar. I'm one of the pulmonary critical care staff here at Walter Reed. I'm going to take you through kind of the overall presentation for COVID-19 patients as well as our hospital triage plan. Overall, we think that the incubation period for COVID-19 patients is 4 to 14 days. This means that prior to presenting with uh, cough, shortness of breath, or fevers, patients may have the teen infection for uh, anywhere for 4 to 14 days. After developing an infection, typically pres patients present with, after six days after exposure, with an admission, uh, present with shortness of breath six days after an exposure, admission to the hospital at day eight, and potentially ICU admission on day 10. Key things to pay attention to regarding COVID-19 infections include a silent hypoxia. This means patients having a, a low oxygen saturation lower than would be predicted by their normal mental status and overall presentation. Also, patients tend to have a precipitous disease decompensation, going from requiring very little supplemental oxygen to requiring sig more significant amounts of supplemental oxygen on the upwards of six liters or uh, mechanical ventilation. Overall, we think that upwards of 5% of, of patients with a COVID-19 infection may require critical care. 14% of patients will likely require some type of observation in an inpatient setting, and most likely 80, upwards of 80% of ca cases will be mild in overall presentation and will likely not require uh, admission to the hospital. In general, we think that upwards of 90% uh, of patients may have a fever during the overall course of their COVID infection. However, only 50% of them have to have uh, fever at time of presentation. Other common presentation, other common signs and symptoms include GI symptoms and uh, altered mental status. Dis discussing specific risk factors that may increase the likelihood of having severe disease, demographic risk factors include an age greater than 55, history of having pulmonary disease or renal dysfunction, high blood pressure, or coronary artery disease. Specific risk factors. Uh, vital signs and laboratory-wise that can predict people having more severe disease include increased respiratory rates, increased work of breathing with increased O2 requirements, or an increased heart rate above 125. Laboratory risk factors include uh, a lymphopenia, an elevated D-dimer, elevated inflammatory markers, or an elevated troponin. Radiographically, we believe that COVID-19 infections can have airspace opacities. CT scans, although not indicated for every patient, can demonstrate ground glass opacities. Please realize that CT scans do come with a significantly increased workload, such as terminal cleanings after each CT scan, so judicious use of CT scans is important. Regarding overall disease progression, we currently believe that there is two separate phases to this disease process an initial phase of a viral response where uh, constitutional symptoms such as fever, dry cough, diarrhea, and headache can be present, and then a host inflammatory response where there is increased inflammatory markers and ARDS, cardiogenic shock, and uh, can both occur. There is likely some overlap between the two. However, it has not been well elucidated where this overlap exists. In terms of general ward care for these patients, we believe that there is no specific therapy that has shown overt benefit. We do suggest avoiding NSAIDs. However, the overall evidence regarding use of NSAIDs is still under study. We would avoid continuous fluids and work towards having a negative or even fluid balance. Monitoring of pulse ox and EKGs with a goal of saturation of 92 to 96% and no, nebula, no nebulized meds, however, this is slightly controversial. Regarding labs, uh, COVID diagnosis labs are suggested on all COVID suspected patients. This includes a nasal swab and respiratory biofire. Realize that the COVID-19 uh, nasal swab is not triggered by the normal coronavirus on the biofire. CRP, D-dimers, LDH, fibrinogen, and ferritin can be used to monitor for an inflammatory response, 
and we suggest monitoring them on a 72-hour basis. Regarding overall initial evaluation and, and ward treatment, there is a high handout available on the COVID-19 toolbox for which there is a link at the end of this presentation. In, regarding specific ICU and triage criteria, ICU admission is based on a clinical decision and an evaluation of trajectory. We strongly consider an ICU consult for an O2 requirement of greater than six liters. RRT and code blue criteria exist per standard procedures, and please remember to retain appropriate PPE during those. At this time, I will pause for Dr. Wes Campbell to talk about the diagnosis. Commander Campbell, the Service Chief for Infectious Diseases, and I'll be discussing diagnosis and treatment as well as infection control for COVID-19. There are some simple key points to remember when uh, trying to diagnose this illness. Nasopharyngeal sampling is the anatomic side of choice for initial diagnostic testing. Sampling in symptomatic patients is to be conducted in full PPE to be reviewed further in the infection control section. And sampling is to be conducted using lab-approved swab and transport material. Use of unauthorized materials may inhibit or degrade lab testing performance. And there's a, the most common transport media that will be used in uh, most institutions. As far as nasopharyngeal swab collection, the technique is fairly simple. Uh, it consists of tilting the head of the patient back to 70 degrees with eyes closed if possible. You want to insert the swab parallel to the palate and go through the depth equal to the opening of the nostril to the opening of the ear. The patient will be uncomfortable. However, the swab needs to be held for approximately uh, one to two seconds while also rotating it back and forth to get a good sample. Next, I'll discuss treatments. Keep in mind that there are no FDA approved treatments or treatments that are known through clinical trials to demonstrate any benefit for outcomes in these patients at this time. The two most common drugs that you may be aware of is hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Hydroxychloroquine does have some studies uh, arguing for and against its use in these patients. However, use of this medication should be done uh, whenever possible with consultation from infectious diseases, as well as use of azithromycin most commonly should be used as part of treatment for community-acquired pneumonia if suspected as a bacterial cause. One of the big concerns with using, with using these medications in combination is a compounding effect of QT interval and risk for cardiac arrhythmias. It is known that COVID-19 has a, has a syndrome uh, described as myocarditis, and the concern is that this will be a compounding uh, effect on the patient and needs to be monitored or performed in a monitored environment. Other therapies you may have heard about is current uh, studies looking into remdesivir, a direct acting antiviral, as well as uh, other therapies that are used primarily by our hematology and co oncology colleagues to uh, modulate immune uh, function in this infection. Other medications that have been discussed in the literature or described in the popular press have been the use of incense, which there's not a lot of data arguing for or against their use and should be used at the provider's discretion. Um, steroids also have a mixed uh, data uh, for their e efficacy and use of these patients. And most providers are avoiding uh, use of these uh, immune modulating therapies. Other drugs such as HIV protease inhibitors um, did not show any benefit in a randomized trial published out of China recently. ACE inhibitors and ARBs have been discussed as a modulating therapy um, to, to disrupt the, what is felt to be the pathway of uh, viral um, virulence uh, in terms of angiotensin converting uh, receptors. And current guidance is to continue these if already on it and not contraindicated uh, for the management of their sepsis syndrome. However, there's no evidence for uh, starting these in the illness itself. Next, I'll discuss transmission and infection control principles. There is estimated 2 to 2.5 new cases for every single case. However, this changes based on social distancing and uh, practices that are already in place 
probably in your institution. Transmission is felt to be predominantly droplet, um, with aerosol and film -like transmission rates uncertain. Viral shedding and other fluids, such as stool, um, are not felt to be a significant mode of transmission. We do know that there is a potential pre-symptomatic transmission period that's been described, uh, hence the CDC updates that indicate that a 48-hour period before symptom onset should be used when risk stratifying potential exposures. Also keep in mind that incubation may range from two to 14 days, with a majority of at-risk patients presenting symptomatically between four and six days after exposure. Early reports suggest that person-to-person -person transmission most commonly happens during close exposure to a person infected with COVID-19. This is primarily via respiratory droplets produced when the infected person coughs or sneezes. These droplets can land in the mouth, nose, or eyes of people who are nearby or inhaled into the lungs of those with clo within close proximity. The con contribution of small resp respirable particles, aka aerosols, to those nearby is cur certainly uncertain, currently uncertain. Airborne transmission over long distances is unlikely. For patients with known or suspected COVID-19, providers should be wearing full PPE. This consists of a droplet, contact precautions, and eye protection. Ideally, this would consist of an N95 respir respirator, but a surgical mask is acceptable if the alternative of N95 is not available. A face shield or goggles is needed, while personal eyeglasses are not considered adequate for full protection of the, of the ocular mucosa. A yellow isolation gown and a pair of clean gloves is also needed for contact precaution. As far as airborne isolation, it's considered only required for sputum induction, bronchoscopy, nebulizer therapy, or intubation or extubation. These are procedures that are felt to produce aerosols that place providers at risk. And COVID-19. I guess everyone's probably aware um, COVID-19 is presenting with um, significant respiratory disease. Um, it's just representative chest x-ray and chest CT showing some of the findings that we see um, among these patients. Um, the, the, as we discussed earlier, the mainstay of treatment is predominantly supportive. Um, and part of that support is uh, supplementing their respiratory failure with, with uh, supplemental oxygen. So this can be applied by uh, nasal cannula or face mask um, and should be applied to all patients to maintain SATs between 92 and 96 uh, percent. Failure to maintain a SAT of greater than 92 percent on six liters of supplemental oxygen uh, should prompt a transfer to the uh, ICU for more intense monitoring and additional oxygen supplementation. Uh, that can come in many different ways as we'll kind of discuss here moving forward. Um, so the first thing we'll discuss is high-flow nasal cannula. Um, this has uh, promising clinical outcomes, uh, but there, uh, its implementation has been limited somewhat by concerns over aerosolization. Um, you may be aware of some initial guidance um, to avoid the use of high-flow nasal cannula, but that has um, largely gone away in the, the recent months. Again, this is an, an evolving uh, clinical picture. Uh, the benefit of high-flow nasal cannula is that by applying high-flow oxygen uh, at flows that exceed miniventilation, uh, we get a very um, effective uh, uh, supplemental oxygen delivery as well as washout of end expiratory CO2. Um, and again, the risk is uh, generation of aerosols um, and a relatively high rate of failure um, in COVID-19 patients. Uh, so our recommendation is going to be to begin high-flow nasal cannula once uh, the patient is requiring supplemental oxygen over six liters. Um, and when, when initiating high-flow nasal cannula, you have to specify a flow as well as a percent oxygen. So uh, an, an example uh, initial setting would be uh, high-flow nasal cannula at 30 liters flow uh, at 40 percent oxygen. Other forms of support can be non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, and that comes in uh, two forms, that's CPAP and BiPAP. Um, surviving sepsis guidelines have 
um, made the statement to um, recommending high flow nasal cannula over non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, and there appears to be a, a limited role for BiPAP, um, but there is a potential role for CPAP, um, especially in patients where there's a, a strong reason to avoid mechanical ventilation. Um, and then finally, um, if we cannot maintain um, adequate oxygen saturations uh, with non-invasive uh, supplemental oxygen measures, uh, we will uh, proceed to mechanical ventilation. Um, many of these patients are presenting with moderate to severe ARDS um, and will require uh, invasive mechanical ventilation uh, and that has to be performed in, in the ICU uh, under the direction of a uh, critical care physician or a member of our team as specified earlier. Uh, recommendations are going to be for uh, lung protective ventilation that's um, uh, involves such things as uh, low tidal volume, uh, permissive hypercapnia, avoidance of uh, high uh, peak pressures or plateau pressures, um, and then uh, appropriate and optimal administration of PEEP um, for uh, lung recruitment and increase in uh, alveol mean alveolar pressure. Uh, there are some salvage modes and salvage measures that you may see implemented while in the uh, intensive care unit um, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, discuss these with you as you help us take care of our patients. Uh, so that concludes our presentation. Uh, thank you for everything that you do as we kind of move forward with this um, extreme challenge uh, of coronavirus-19. Uh, please wash your hands and stay safe. Uh, and uh, for additional resources, um, please visit um, covid19toolbox.com. Uh, that has a, a, a plethora of resources uh, for you to review. Thank you.